is a, a, a capacity in objects to uh, cause pleasure in us by their, their appearance, or possibly even beauty is the pleasurable uh, experience itself, depending on how you uh, interpret this view. Uh, we also looked at uh, the Platonic account um, on which beauty is a transcendental form uh, and a, a kind of a fundamental feature of reality which we're able to uh, uh, experience perceptually. Um, what we didn't get on to uh, was Kant's account of beauty. Um, I, I should say about this picture of Kant, normally you're probably used to seeing there's a more famous picture where he's sort of leaning down, looking rather intense, uh, much older. I found this one online. Um, I'm not entirely sure it is really Kant. I couldn't... <laughs> I mean, I, there was no indication that it was. Um, but it comes up if you search uh, uh, for Kant paintings. I found no information on this at all. But anyway, I thought it's a, a nice break from the uh, more usual uh, uh, pictures. Um, so Kant is uh, arguably the most influential aesthetician of the modern age and, and perhaps of all time. Um, his work in aesthetics appears primarily in his 1790 uh, work, The Critique of Judgment. Um, and this is the third in a trilogy of books, uh, which, although you don't need to understand the trilogy, uh, perhaps you do, you don't need to understand it at least to get uh, some idea of Kant's aesthetics. Uh, it might be useful to have a, a, a broad uh, uh, idea of how he's gotten to the point he's at. Um, so, I mean, there, there, there's three books in this trilogy. One way of characterizing them is to say that they each uh, investigate one of three higher cognitive faculties um, which we have, and these are uh, uh, understanding, reason, and judgment, respectively. Um, uh, and, and these are looked at in the uh, 1781 Critique of Pure Reason, which has a, an important edition in 1787. Uh, the 1788 Critique of Practical Reason, which is uh, uh, primarily a work on, on ethics, or, or perhaps uh, meta-ethics. Uh, and then the Critique of Judgment itself, these are also supplemented by the 1783 uh, Prologue Legomena to Any Future Metaphysics and the 1785 Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. So by the time you're at the Critique of Judgment, quite a lot of work has been done. Um, on a rather simplified understanding, in each of these works, Kant takes the relevant higher faculty uh, and he investigates how it operates and what can be concluded from this. Uh, and the significant answer that he comes to in each case uh, is that the faculty uh, operates uh, uh, synthetically in accordance with an a priori principle, and this means roughly you've probably come across these terms before, uh, it operates synthetically because it goes beyond mere analytical conceptual truths, uh, uh, all bachelors or unmarried men, that kind of thing, but a priori because it does so without uh, 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 appealing to experience. Um, so the critique of judgment deals with aesthetics uh, ostensibly because it is in judgments of beauty that Kant thinks the power of judgment requires an a priori principle. So this is, this is where it, how it ties in to this uh, 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 
monolithic uh, uh, picture he has uh, of philosophy. Um, I won't say anything more about all three. You don't really need to know much more. Um, even though the critique of judgment is embedded in this wider philosophy, uh, a great deal of what's said in it can be understood and taken away uh, uh, without having much of the background of that philosophy in place. Um, I think the only other thing you need to know in advance is that in the first critique, uh, the critique of pure reason, uh, Kant claims, or, or argues, uh, that judgments can be analyzed under four headings, understood under four headings, and these are quantity, quality, relation, and modality. Um, and he calls these, these categorizations moments, um, or at least that's how it's translated, I assume, from Latin. I don't know. Uh, and so for this reason, he's got these four, four uh, uh, categories under which to understand judgments. And so when he's looking at judgments of beauty, uh, he presents a picture of them uh, uh, under these four headings uh, in terms. So these are the four moments, they're called, of uh, Kant's uh, uh, discussion of beauty. Um, so I'll just go through these in turn, and then I'll say one other thing about Kant, and then we'll move on to the subject of the, today's uh, uh, lecture on what it was so, supposed to be, which is the, the sublime. Um, so the first movement is the quality of judgments of beauty. Kant says the quality of judgments of beauty is disinterestedness. Um, so like the empiricists we discussed last week, Kant thinks that uh, usually uh, when, uh, well, Kant thinks that uh, judgments of beauty involve some kind of pleasure or satisfaction is the usual term used in this context. However, uh, Kant thinks that usually when we experience pleasure or satisfaction uh, uh, in judging something, when it's agreeable or good, as he said, as he says, uh, we desire it or we're we're interested in its existence. Um, interested meaning they're not merely, oh, isn't that interesting, but uh, we have a personal interest in it, you might say. Um, however, in the case of judging something beautiful, even though there's pleasure involved in this judgment, um, strictly thinking, I think, antecedent to the judgment, but there somehow, uh, we're not interested in the object's existence, uh, we are rather disinterested in making this judgment. Uh, th this is an important aesthetic concept. It doesn't actually originate with Kant. Uh, there are earlier works, importantly, um, uh, uh, Anthony Ashley Cooper, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, uh, uh, has a work, uh, an 1809 work, The Moralist, in which this, this idea uh, appears. And many later expeditions have thought this was very insightful. You know, when you enjoy something beautiful, it's not just like, uh, 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 taking sensual pleasure in something usual. Uh, it's so, you know, it seems, some people feel at least, it seems a more noble thing to be doing. And one way to cash out that intuition is to say, well, this is an in, a disinterested pleasure. Okay, the second moment, the quantity of judgments of beauty is universality. Uh, judgments of beauty for Kant purport to be universally valid. Um, by which he means something like this. If I judge something to be beautiful, then I think that you should also judge it to be beautiful. Um, and Kant actually suggests that this can be deduced from the first movement because by definition, a judgment of beauty involves no personal interest. Uh, and so it must be the same for everyone. I mean, it's not entirely clear if that argument works. You might think it might involve no personal interest, but still involve personal temperament. Um, but, but he does uh, suggest this. Um, and this again distinguishes judgments of beauty from judgments of the agreeable or, or pleasurable or enjoyable uh, in that in the case of those judgments, we, we don't really care if everyone agrees with us. Um, if I prefer uh, uh, real ale and Samuel Hughes prefers gin and tonics, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> not concerned by this this fact, but uh, uh, if I prefer Titian and Sam prefers uh, 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 
Damien Hirst, then I might say, well, no, Sam, this, this isn't right. You've got to look harder. Um, okay, so, so, oh, I should have said, actually, Kant gives us a definition of beauty in the case of each of these movements, so, moments. Uh, so in the first case, in the case of the first moment, uh, he says, uh, pace is the faculty for judging an object or a kind of representation through a satisfaction or dissatisfaction without any interest. The object of such satisfaction is called beautiful. Um, in the case of this second movement, universality, uh, he says, uh, that is beautiful which pleases universally without a concept. Um, he says without a concept there because Kant doesn't think judgments of beauty are the only ones which are universal, uh, but he thinks that usually when a judgment is universal, when uh, you're justified in insisting that other people agree with you in it, it's because you're subsuming something under a concept. But he thinks, weirdly, in the case of judgments of beauty, that's not what's going on. Um, third movement. So the third movement is the relation of judgments of beauty, and this, Kant says, is subjective purposiveness. Um, now, by this he means judgments of beauty, uh, unlike those of things that are good or enjoyable, don't attribute any purpose to uh, the objects uh, uh, of judgment, any purpose they're supposed to satisfy. However, uh, despite the fact that judgments of beauty don't require a beautiful object to have an end, uh, Kant nonetheless seems to think that we can't explain or conceive of beauty except as if it were arranged in accordance with some end. Um, that, that almost seems to border on paradox, but, but this is actually consistent if you think about it. Uh, uh, there's nothing contradictory about saying that uh, you can't understand something except by thinking of it as though it were F, despite the fact it isn't actually F. Uh, perhaps there are intuitive examples of this. Um, for instance, you might say that in fiction you really can't understand a work of fiction unless you think of the characters as if they're people, but they're not actually people. Uh, uh, they're, well, at most fictive people, uh, perhaps even only words on paper or something like that. Another possible example of this kind of thing would be when you're looking at a portrait and uh, you can't understand a portrait unless you think of the image you're seeing as that of a face uh, rather than of a load of paint on canvas. You might even have to think of it as both simultaneously. Um, some aestheticians, Roger Scruton, first amongst them, has said that uh, aesthetic appreciation often involves this double intentionality. Um, that's something of a tangent from uh, uh, the third movement. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, I think it's at least you know, intuitively plausible that uh, we can understand to judge something as beautiful, you have to think of it as though it were for something. Um, you know, it, it, we, we think something beautiful is somehow valuable in succeeding, and usually success of that sort involves succeeding at some purpose. Um, in any case, Kant offers a definition of beauty from this movement as well. Uh, in this case, he says that beauty is the form of the purposiveness of an object insofar as it is perceived in it without representation of an end. I know these aren't particularly uh, uh, clear. I mean, it's, it's a complex theory to go through quickly, but at least you can get something of an impressionistic idea of it. Uh, finally, the fourth movement uh, is the modality of... Uh, uh, judgments of beauty. Uh, Kant says the modality of judgments of beauty is necessity. Uh, and in explaining this, he says that uh, a representation of something beautiful has a necessary connection to satisfaction. It's not merely that, uh, well, it's not that everyone will feel this satisfaction in the beautiful thing. Uh, neither is there a moral law or moral obligation satisfaction, at least one we can state. Uh, nonetheless, when we judge something beautiful, we can't help but feel that everyone should judge it beautiful as well. Um, 
Kant says at one point that the judgment is understood as uh, an example of a universal law which we can't nonetheless produce. Um, and he has a definition in this case as well, that is beautiful, which is cognized without a concept as the object of a necessary satisfaction. You could be forgiven for thinking that this is uh, very close to the uh, second moment, that of universality. Um, and in fact, I gather that uh, in the literature on Kant, it, it's suggested that Kant intends this, and some people suggest that Kant intends this really, uh, uh, to um, provide a unifying force and focus for the other three moments. That's how the Kant scholar Christian Wenzel puts it. Um, the final thing I'll, I'll say about Kant's account of beauty is uh, the deduction of the power of judgment. Okay? So in Kant's crit critical philosophy, he has these uh, things called transcendental deductions. This is, uh, uh, could be understood as a justification for a kind of uh, synthetic a priori judgment. Um, so Kant thinks there's something peculiar about judgments of beauty on the one hand, they claim the assent of everyone, they're universal, necessary, uh, as if they were about something really out there in the world, uh, which we're getting to know about. But then on the other, he thinks they're not provable, uh, and they don't involve the application of a concept which really holds here. Uh, and in fact, they're made with, uh, well, in some sense, on the basis of a feeling of pleasure, as though they were just a matter of what we describe as personal taste, uh, uh, like preferring uh, uh, gin and tonics to, to real ale. Um, so some kind of explanation of this is needed. Uh, in Kant's terms, a deduction of, the, uh, of judgments of beauty is required, uh, which would show how they can be universally valid and necessary without being demonstrable by proof or that kind of thing. And Kant says this, uh, this deduction is, uh, or this justification is provided by the fact that judgments of beauty involve only the power of judgment itself uh, directed at the subjective conditions for its own use. Uh, and by this, Kant means, or at least seems to mean, that these judgments involve only elements that can be presupposed in human beings as a prerequisite uh, for their experience, for their cognition. This is a, a classic Kantian move. Uh, the point is, humans, as, as a rational agents, or even rational animals, uh, must have various uh, faculties uh, in order to experience phenomena, as we do. And in the case, one of these is the power of judgment. In the case of the power of judgment, because it's uh, disinterested because nothing personal is coming in and so forth. It's only these faculties which every human has which are uh, 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 operating, and they seem to only operate on themselves, although that might be a controversial uh, 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 interpretation of Kant. Uh, but if that's the case, then we can expect the same uh, uh, judgments to be made in all cases, despite the fact that this isn't subsuming something over under a concept. Uh, despite the fact that these aren't normal objective judgments about things out there in the world. Um, there's, there's an element here of uh, what we saw in the empiricist account of beauty last week. Um, you remember that Hume uh, says, well, judgments of taste, uh, it really it's just uh, uh, down to quite arbitrary things, but people tend to have the same experience. Human nature is quite uh, uh, regular, so we can expect the same judgments of taste in different places, uh, so long as people discriminate carefully, that kind of thing. Uh, Kant takes this one step further, you might say, in saying it's not just uh, uh, the uh, contingent regularity of uh, human nature which makes judgments of taste, judgments of beauty, universally valid. Rather, it's a prerequisite for uh, being a rational uh, animal at all. I say rational animal there rather than just a rational agent or rational being because Kant does say on, I think, page 95 of the Cambridge edition that a uh, disembodied spirit couldn't judge things beautiful. Um, 
I, I'm not quite sure of what, what the reason for that is, but uh, it's an interesting quirk of the theory, if you like. Okay, um, I won't say anything in, in assessment of that in relation to the other theories of beauty so that we can get on to today's subject. Maybe I'll say something at the end. Oh, how do I go back? The sublime. Um, I realize I've actually already used a, a good third of the time of this, so we'll see. Maybe the uh, second half of this will come next week. Uh, so this is uh, Ruskin's view again up in Cumbria. I gave it as the uh, uh, front picture last week for the beautiful in daytime. It's the view that uh, uh, the 19th century critic John Ruskin said uh, it's the most beautiful in England and therefore the world. Uh, at night time, though, it's actually quite a good uh, example uh, of a distinct aesthetic concept or property. Um, so, you'll remember that I said, both last week and the week before, that we can distinguish two senses of beautiful. Um, there's a very broad sense which applies to all sorts of things which we might say are aesthetically pleasing, and there's a narrower sense which applies to light, bright, cheerful, harmonious, sparkling things, but not to a lot of other things which we might nonetheless take an aesthetic interest in. Um, so, for those other things, if we want to be more specific about what is aesthetically interesting about them, we need some other aesthetic concepts or, or properties or whatever you want to class them as. Um, first amongst these in the history of aesthetics, uh, arguably, is the property known as the sublime. I say arguably, you might say that the ugly is the uh, most important, second, second most important uh, uh, topic, um, although it's only received close attention relatively recently, I'd say. Um, in any case, uh, today I'll, well, I'll try to uh, go through three treatments of this property or concept of the sublime. Um, the first is from the ancient author uh, Longinus, or Longinus, as he's been pronounced. Uh, the second is back to one of the empiricist philosophers from last time, Edmund Burke. And then the third, if we get to it, we'll be going back to Kant's critique of judgment. Um, <laughs> or, or indeed, we might be starting another lecture with that same work next week. Um, so, uh, and this is a concept, it, it, the sublime, it rose to a position of prominence really in the 18th century, uh, and it takes quite an important role in uh, the aesthetic thought of philosophers after that, in, in people like Hegel and Schopenhauer, uh, and then becomes uh, uh, decreasingly important, or increasingly less important, uh, into the 20th century. Um, I, I won't get on to any of that stuff. Um, it's in introducing this concept, the sublime, it's worth noting uh, the concept of beauty or the beautiful has remained relatively stable, at least the meaning of the word beauty has remained relatively stable for the last few hundred years, um, perhaps longer depending on, on your own assessment of it. Uh, the word sublime hasn't. So we do still use the word sublime today. Uh, usually it's not to mean anything very specific. Um, I read one blog online recently which said that the current uses of the word sublime generally means uh, something like, I like it in a pretentious way. Um, <laughs> that's not what it meant uh, 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 in the 18th century. Um, rather, it's meant to pick out a specific uh, kind of aesthetic property, something we appreciate aesthetically, uh, which is obviously distinct from paradigmatic examples of beauty. Um, so where beautiful things, you might say, are, are usually uh, pleasant, inviting, delicate, playful, joyous, uh, harmonious, uh, the sublime is conceived usually as threatening, hostile, or overwhelming. Uh, of colossal seriousness or gravity, and even dread. Um, 
So I have some examples. That, well, is the first example, but we'll go to the beauty first. So this is some English fields. English fields in the sunshine are a paradigmatic example of beauty, beautiful things. Perhaps I should stand to the side so you can see. Uh, examples of things that might be considered sublime in the traditional sense. Uh, this is a rather impressive high uh, rock on the beach, quite overwhelming in its uh, 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 mere size and stature, I think you'll agree. Um, perhaps a, a more classic example, mountains, uh, jagged grey mountains looking rather threatening and hostile. Uh, 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 this, uh, this is a uh, volcanic lightning storm. Um, <laughs> I think you might argue this is sublime. Certainly you can quite enjoy looking at it. It's rather impressive. Uh, sense of danger. You wouldn't say, oh, how was the volcanic lightning storm? It was beautiful. You, you might say, well, sublime. Uh, if you sublime. Uh, I'll give a, a final example. Um, is an example of the sublime in art. Um, this is, uh, uh, oh God, you can barely see it. Uh, but, uh, well, this is uh, uh, William Turner's uh, Hannibal Crossing the Alps, uh, 1812 picture, uh, where if you could see it, you'd be able to see the uh, dynamic weather conditions and the uh, static imposing landscape combining in a very theatrical way. Uh, since you can't, well, you can't. This is not William Turner. He used to live in 16 St. John Street. That's the uh, slightly lesser known watercolor artist. He was the sadly slightly more famous one, but not necessarily wrong with uh, so hopefully that gives some idea of what we're talking about in the case of the sublime. Um, I, I think you know, it's a pretty intuitive idea. We enjoy looking at uh, volcanic lightning storms, huge colossal landscapes, uh, the paintings of the uh, uh, greater William Turner. Uh, and the reason we like looking at these things is not quite the same as the reason we like looking at uh, uh, flowers and gardens. Ballet dancers, well, ballet dancing could be sublime as well. It depends on the dance. Um, so anyway, the earliest work usually cited in the context of the sublime uh, is called, well, it's translated on the sublime uh, from the Greek Paripsus. Uh, and this is by, well, this is traditionally attributed to the third century AD philosopher Cassius Longinus. Uh, however, for a variety of reasons, this attribution is, is generally thought unjustifiable now. Um, and it's usually thought to have been composed this treatise sometime in the first century AD by an unknown author. Um, I think you know, it doesn't cite anything after that. Then that's one of the classic signs of this use of language, that kind of thing as well. Um, it's, it's really the only uh, uh, extent or at least known precedent to the modern discussion. Um, so, so it comes up generally as a courtesy mention, which I'm giving it now. Uh, the author of this work describes the sublime as follows. He says, The sublime, whenever it occurs, consists in a certain loftiness and excellence of language, and it is by this and this only that the greatest poets and prose writers have gained eminence and won themselves a lasting place in the temple of fame. A lofty passage does not convince the reader uh, by reason, but takes him out of himself. That which is admirable ever confounds our judgment and eclipses that which is merely reasonable or agreeable. A sublime thought if happily timed, illuminates the entire subject with the vividness of a lightning flash and exhibits the whole power of the auditor uh, in a moment of time. Um, clearly, the author of this work is concerned with the properties of literary artifacts only, and what he has in mind is something of a general quality of literary excellence, it seems. I mean, he says that this is the only way that our, our, our prose and poem writers uh, have gotten into the Temple of Fame. Um, so it seems to be the main criterion of literary success, uh, which is perhaps rather broader uh, uh, than the 
more recent notice, uh, notion of the sublime we'll get on to. Uh, it has associated with it a, a kind of loftiness, a grandeur. Um, and in a way, this quotation, I think, um, shows something of the idea of the sublime we're going to go on to in appreciating a, a kind of an extreme force, uh, uh, grandness and weightiness, as opposed to, to the uh, perhaps uh, 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 lighter delicacy we might associate with beauty. Um, so that's the only ancient work. Uh, the change or the uh, 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 instigation of the modern notion of the sublime uh, comes about at the beginning of the 18th century, as all these things do, uh, and it's associated with writers like John Ad uh, Joseph Addison and John Dennis, who began to use the term in relation to a pleasurable aesthetic experience involving elements usually associated with displeasure. Um, Dennis is noted in particular for his description of crossing the Alps, uh, where the pleasure he took in the landscape was mingled with horrors and sometimes almost with despair. Um, and so throughout the early 18th century, you get uh, this notion of peering. People take a lot more interest in a, uh, uh, mountain landscapes and so forth at that time. It's sometimes suggested that uh, no one ever did take an interest in the aesthetic qualities of mountain landscapes before then, although Petrarch has a letter where he uh, 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 exhibits some interest in this in uh, 1336. I don't know if there are any other instances before the 18th century. Um, in any case, uh, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, Edmund Burke publishes his uh, uh, 1857 work, uh, Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin, the Ideas of the Beautiful and the Sublime, I think that's the right way around, uh, in which he gives the first philosophical uh, discussion and characterization of this notion. I don't know if I, I said before that uh, Edmund Burke, uh, I mean, we looked at this work a bit last week, uh, although when, he, when it was uh, uh, published in, in 1857, Burke would have been almost 30, it's thought that when he, he composed it, it was, uh, uh, he was only 19. Um, so when I mean to him shortly from now, uh, <laughs> that should be kept in mind, uh, perhaps. Um, and Burke opens this, this work, The Inquiry, uh, with an acknowledgement of his debt to the author of On the Sublime, of Harry Hupsus. Uh, which he did take to have been composed by uh, Longinus. Um, however, he says that Longinus uh, brings too many things under this title of the sublime, uh, and in particular things which Burke considers to be repugnant to one another, things which aren't really uh, of the same category. So early on, Burke offers his own definition of the sublime as follows. He says, the passions which belong to self-preservation turn on pain and danger. They are simply painful when their causes immediately affect us. They are delightful when we have an idea of pain and danger without being actually in such circumstances. This delight I have not called pleasure because it turns on pain and because it is different enough from the idea Whatever excites this delight, I call sublime. So, for Burke, the sublime is whatever excites delight uh, by or through the idea of pain and danger when we're not actually suffering these things, when it's merely an idea, perhaps when you're watching someone else in pain and danger. Uh, So after defining uh, the sublime in these terms, Burke goes on to describe a number of features commensurate with it. Uh, the most important of these are terror, obscurity, power, privation, vastness, infinity, difficulty, and magnificence. I, I say those are the most important. They might have been the ones I picked out of seeming the most important. Yes, quite a lot. Uh, I didn't have a... Uh, a rigorous method in doing that. 
Um, by difficulty uh, uh, on that list, Burke means uh, uh, the, the requirement of immense force in production. And uh, he gives the example of a, a stone henge. Um, I suppose he had taken a picture where the uh, uh, weather conditions add to the sublimity, but uh, the point is we're supposed to get a sense of the, the sublime just because uh, it's difficult to imagine how these, these stones were moved, how this was put together. There's a sense of extreme human effort uh, uh, in this. Another example would be the uh, pyramids, of course, the great pyramids of Egypt. Um, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, I think Burke, and more interestingly, perhaps Longinus, both give us literary examples of the sublime uh, biblical quotations from the uh, Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. And one of them I think they both use is, is the opening lines of Genesis. Um, uh, 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 in the beginning, God made the uh, heavens and the earth. Uh, uh, and so there you have a sense of uh, perhaps the same kind of difficulty, although I suppose it's not difficult technically, but this vast scale of production of, of power and, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, and Burke makes it clear that although uh, the sublime doesn't mean the ugly, these things aren't, aren't ugly, uh, nonetheless the notion contrasts directly with that of beauty. Um, he uh, characterizes beauty as occurring in things that are comparatively small, smooth, have a variety in the direction of their parts. They're uh, not angular, though. Uh, they're of a delicate frame, lack the appearance of strength, and have colors which are uh, clear and bright without being very strong or glaring. Um, and Burke suggests that when the sublime and the beautiful appear together, although it is possible for them to occur together, they're diminished by this. He says uh, it, it's like when you have black and white intermingled. Uh, you don't get full force of black as black and white as white. Um, that's quite an interesting comment because, of course, you might think that when you have two very different or contrasting things together, they'll actually both be accentuated by the contrast. In fact, Burke's example of black and white might not be very good for that reason because, in a sense, black shows up better against white and vice versa. Um, However, uh, you can get from this an idea that in experiencing the sublime, you're not able simultaneously to experience the beautiful. This is meant to be a, a powerful or overwhelming uh, uh, occurrence. And in fact, Burke says somewhere that it's meant to be, or that he thinks it is, the most powerful emotion a, a human can undergo. Um, and so you can see why, well, if that's the case, uh, presumably you couldn't simultaneously also be enjoying the beauty of uh, uh, something whilst undergoing this experience to the same degree. Uh, Burke doesn't think beauty is, is, is as strong. If I hurry, I shall get through Kant as well. I'll just give another example of the sublime uh, which Burke offers us. Um, so although I've been giving visual examples mainly, uh, and Burke tends to give, well, I suppose visual examples, perhaps so, uh, in any case, he certainly does, like the author of the ancient text, Perry uh think that the sublime occurs in literary texts. Uh, and a very uh, uh, evocative example he gives is uh, Milton's description of death in the second book of Paradise Lost. Um, it says, uh, the other shape, its shape it might be called, that shape had none distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance might be called that shadow seemed, but each seemed either. Black he stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a deathly dark. What seemed his head, the likeness of a kingly crown had on. Um, so there's a few elements there which are, are sublime, uh, you know, the dark and so forth, but also in particular, a lack of clarity in the picture, what seemed his head. Uh, there's a sense of uncertainty, uh, uh, similar to, to um, 
uh, fear which can be brought on by darkness in, in children or uh, cowards. Um, uh, so uh, Burke's description of the sublime, I think, are very suggestive, uh, as is his discussion of beauty as well. Uh, when it comes to what causes the experience of the sublime, his account might be said to become less persuasive. So Burke suggests that both uh, beauty and the sublime uh, might have simple physiological causes. Um, there's an example here somewhere. Yes, well, Burke uh, uh, suggests that in the former case, in the case of beauty, uh, the physiological cause is the uh, relaxation or softening of, of the nerves. Whereas in the latter case, in the case of the sublime, it's the opposite. It's the uh, uh, tension or exertion uh, of the nerves. Uh, he gives the particular example uh, of the case of darkness, seeming terrible. And uh, he says that uh, perhaps uh, darkness gives a sense of the sublime and of terror uh, because it causes a tension in the iris by making it expand. You know how your irises get larger when, you're, when it's dark. Um, he acknowledges that uh, some might object that the ill effects of darkness or blackness seem rather mental than corporeal, uh, but he, he sort of brushes this off with the suggestion that, well, something has to happen with the body first. Uh, I think that sounds pretty implausible that uh, uh, experience of the sublime has anything to do with the movement of your irises. I suppose they might be an element in a causal chain, but... Uh, it, you might suggest, well, we could test this by uh, artificially uh, expanding someone's iris without them seeing anything magnificent, big, dark, or so forth. Now, is it really plausible that suppose they were watching television or something instead, we gave them anesthetics, would they get an experience of the sublime? Um, well, I suppose that's an empirical question, although uh, intuitively it, it feels unlikely. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to cover Kant on the sublime as well. Um, so Kant uh, picks up on the concept of the sublime during his pre-critical stage. I summarized at the beginning of this lecture Kant's critical philosophy, the really influential stuff which happened in the uh, 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 1780s primarily, means uh, some pre-1790s. Um, However, Kant was already a very established and relatively uh, uh, aged uh, philosopher by the time he started composing those works, and he had a reasonably distinguished career behind him. Um, and he has a uh, 1764 book, which came out shortly after Burke's Philosophical Inquiry, entitled Observations on the Feeling of the Beautiful and the Sublime. Um, I won't say much about this. It's... Uh, interesting historically this work is I suppose just for understanding the character of Kant um, after outlining uh, uh, his understanding of the distinction between the beautiful and the sublime in this work Kant spends the, uh, the majority of it analyzing human nature in terms of our feeling of these aesthetic qualities and in particular he looks at the difference between persons of the different uh, humors in accordance to the uh, 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 traditional development uh, division of temperaments into uh, melancholic, uh, sanguine, choleric, and phlegmatic. These are the uh, 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 four of them. Uh, Kant also goes on to look at the difference between uh, men and women, uh, people of different national backgrounds, and the whole work is uh, 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 somewhat <laughs> politically incorrect, uh, to say the <laughs> least. Um, however, Kant does return to the sub subject of uh, the sublime in a more philosophical vein in the 1790 work, which we talked about earlier, the Critique of Judgment. Um, so I said that Kant analyzes the concept of beauty uh, under the four categories or, or moments of quantity, quality, relation, and modality. Um, the sublime, it turns out, uh, has the same properties as uh, the beautiful insofar as these categories are concerned. Uh, that is, the sublime must be represented as universally valid in its quantity uh, without interest or disinterested in its quality. 
uh, as subjectively purposive in its relation and as necessary in its modality. You might think an interesting question here, well, perhaps it's not interesting to Kant scholars, um, but you might find it interesting to ask what happens to Kant's definitions of beauty if this is the case. He gave four definitions of beauty based on uh, uh, this analysis of beauty under these four moments, and it turns out that those definitions apply equally to the sublime. Um, perhaps you might argue that Kant isn't opposing the beautiful and the sublime uh, uh, so strongly there, and the beautiful might cover the sublime. Uh, I expect there are different opinions on this in scholarship. Um, anyway, uh, Kant does assert that there's some crucial difference between the sublime and the beautiful, in that the former, uh, uh, the sublime, uh, involves a movement of the mind. Uh, and this movement, as Kant calls it, can occur in one of two directions. Uh, the sublime can move the mind either towards its faculty of cognition or towards the faculty of desire. Uh, these are the faculties uh, uh, broadly associated with the understanding and with reason, the topics of the first two critiques. Um, obviously, this is, this is a, a lot of Kantian jargon uh, to, to understand, but the thing to take away from this is that there are two kinds of the sublime for Kant, or some readers of Kant like to say it's two ways of understanding the sublime. Um, and these are called the mathematical sublime and the dynamic sublime. Um, so under the heading of the mathematical sublime, Kant gives the following three definitions. He says, uh, we call the sublime that which is absolutely great. That is sublime in comparison to which everything else is small. And that is sublime which even to be able to think of demonstrates a faculty of the mind that surpasses every measure of the senses. The third one there being slightly more complex than the previous two. Uh, the idea of something being absolutely great um, is a somewhat difficult one. Uh, by greatness can certainly seem to mean magnitude here, as opposed to grandeur or magnificence, it means size. But of course, he can't mean to suggest that the only objects that can uh, cause a feeling of the sublime in us have to be larger than every other object. Um, I mean, presumably, there'd only be one, uh, if at all, which would be the whole universe uh, taken together. Uh, so, rather, Kant says that, well, he says there are two ways in which we estimate greatness and size. Uh, we do so aesthetically and by measuring. Uh, so though there's nothing so great that we couldn't measure it, many things are too great for us to get a, a, a satisfactory feel for their size. Um, and it's in this latter sense uh, that Kant considers sublime objects mathematically sublime objects to be absolutely great. I've got, that's the closest I could get to a picture of something absolutely great. Uh, that's the, that's the uh, famous uh, uh, NASA photograph called uh, the, the Pillars of Creation. Uh, these are uh, um, uh, stellar nebula, or they might be in fact galactic nebula. I don't know, anyway, they're really very huge. Um, <laughs> so when we experience the mathematical sublime, we're overwhelmed by the magnitude of something, but nonetheless, we're aware that we could measure it. We're unable to estimate its greatness aesthetically, but we could do by measurement um, or by reason. And it's this superiority of our reason to our aesthetic estimation that Kant says accounts for the pleasure we take in the sublime. Um, I have a quotation, but it goes along quite a long time. I'll give you the second one. Uh, so Kant speaks of the sublime as uh, arousing the feeling of our supersensible vocation in us, which well, by that he seems to mean it arouses an understanding of ourselves as rational agents, who though we are 
much smaller than stellar nebula, but we are nonetheless in some sense greater because we have reason. Uh, or, or again, he says, uh, we found our own limitation in the, in the immeasurability of nature and the insufficiency of our capacity to adopt a standard proportionate to the aesthetic estimation of the magnitude of its domain. domain. But nevertheless, at the same time, we found in our own faculty of reason another nonsensible standard which has that very infinity under itself as a unit against which everything in nature is small and found in our own mind a superiority over nature even in its immeasurability. That sentence goes on for another few pages. <laughs> I'll stop it there. Uh, I had better not go through the whole of dynamic sublime here. Um, that's, that's the mathematical sublime. There's also the dynamic sublime, which is associated not with absolute greatness, but with danger or objects of fear, but nonetheless objects of fear, rather like in the case of Burke, which do not pose an immediate threat or danger, roughly speaking. Uh, Kant's favorite example of this is a stormy sea. Um, likewise, in this case, Kant associates our experience of the sublime uh, with something profoundly important in our understanding of our own nature as rational agents. Um, so profoundly important that I'll leave it for next time. demonstrates a faculty of the mind that surpasses every measure of the senses. Good, that will be on the test. Well done, brother.